Okay, we are live. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are expecting a few more counselors to join the Zoom shortly, uh, our virtual meeting, but uh, I will call the general committee meeting to order now as we do have quorum. Of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, council is practicing physical distancing, uh, general committee and uh, members of council, executive management, the city clerk are all participating via video conference, senior leadership team, uh, members who have items on tonight's agenda are present on the call but not visible and are available to answer questions to help council with our deliberations. Uh, we do have a presentation tonight, which we'll do right after the consent agenda. Uh, as always, for the consent items, I'll read out the title associated with the recommended motions from the staff reports and the items for discussion. Please ask that the item be held if you wish to discuss it further tonight. If the item's not held, the motion printed on the agenda is deemed to be approved on consent and we'll go forward to City Council at our next meeting for consideration. Uh, we do have a report of a reference committee tonight. It's the City Building Committee report from November 3rd. That's to be received. City Building Committee has recommended the following motions. Uh, first, regarding investigation of the road conditions on Jean Street and Tyndall Road. No holds, that is approved. Next item is uh, motion 20G172, referred by City Council dated October 26th. This is with regards to the surplusing of city owned property on Vesper Street. No holds, that is approved. Uh, we have a municipal her uh, heritage register, excuse me, heritage registry listing. That's for 50 Tiffin Street. No holds, that is approved. And uh, a heritage registry listing for 56 Cumberland. No holds, <clears throat> excuse me, no holds there, that's approved. Uh, the staff reports this week. Uh, first, we have the tourism master plan. Uh, if a member of council could hold that. I will that, hold it until uh, after the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Count, uh, Deputy Mayor Ward. It's held. Uh, the next item is the business plan status as at September 3rd, uh, 30th, excuse me, also known as our third quarter report. Hold. Held by Councillor McCann, yep. Next item is with regards to the deputy mayor position. No holds, that is approved. Uh, finally, we have the investigation of Girdwood Drive on-street parking restrictions, staff report. No holds, that is approved. Items for discussion, we have four on tonight's agenda, uh, all investigation for reports back. Uh, the first put on by Councilor Aylwin is with regards to an all-way stop at the intersection of Owen and Wellington. No holds, that is approved. Second is the investigation, uh, investigation into the potential establishment of an Arts and Culture Advisory Committee. No holds, that is approved. Next, we have the investigation uh, and investigation of enhanced safety at the intersection of Shirley and Ann Street. That's put on by Councilor Thompson. No holds, that is approved. Finally, the investigation into implementation of a minor grading bylaw, that's also put on by Councillor Thompson. No holds there, that is approved, okay. So uh, the two items held, the first is the tourism master plan, which is the subject of our presentation tonight, and then the third quarter report. Uh, so with that, we'll move straight to the presentation. Stephanie Schlichter, our Director of Economic and Creative Development is with us to provide the presentation on our new tourism master plan. Ms. Schlichter, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm just sharing my screen here. And can everybody see the full screen? I can't see anybody. <laughs> okay. Not yet. Not yet. We can't see it yet. It's not being shared. Hmm. Okay. Trying one last time. Ha ha. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that.
Okay, uh, your worship, I can see you. If I could get a thumbs up that you can see the full screen. Perfect, I will get started. Thank you for your patience. Uh, and thank you, your worship and members of council for allowing me to present the tourism master plan today. The tourism master plan came as a result of council direction that was in conjunction with the approval for the municipal accommodation tax, which is intended to provide both the city and destination marketing organization, which for us is Tourism Barry, with a stable revenue stream generated from tourist activity. The purpose of the plan is to create a long-term vision for the role of tourism as an economic driver and provide a series of short-term initiatives and actions that will move the city closer to achieving that vision. It is important to note that the tourism master plan, the bulk of the work was created prior to the pandemic and it really is designed to be implemented in a post-pandemic climate. As such, tonight we're presenting the master plan to seek approval in principle for the overall strategy with a view to report back in spring 2021 with a prioritized action plan that is reflective of the health and economic conditions that we're facing and that will complement current recovery work being taken by Tourism Barry and our team at Invest Barry. The Tourism Master Plan is a result of research and stakeholder consultation, destination and asset analysis. And specifically, our consultants looked at all the tourism centric assets in the city, spoke to over 80 stakeholders from industry to our city regional players and considered existing plans and how they could play a role in Barry's tourism strategy. They also looked at what other successful destinations are doing. Their key findings focus on developing the tourism sector with a lens on the economic development side of tourism, investing in Barry and its tourism products and developing and aligning the brand around that focus. So before we go too far, what does tourism incorporate? I think we often think of the waterfront as our sole source of tourism here in the city, but tourism encompasses so much more and touches on so many parts of our local economy, from arts and culture, open park space, shopping experiences, and all of the supporting resources around it. It is really important that the Tourism Master Plan looked at all of this from a broader visitor economy context. And in taking that holistic view of tourism and advancing all of its asset, not only does it serve to increase revenues in the city through the MAT and overall increased spending in the city, but it also builds on our strategic positioning in the city as a lifestyle destination that will attract the skilled talent we need to support our businesses, the new residents we need to fulfill our growth planning and projections, the development of new businesses that will drive our employment and economic growth, and support continuous investments into assets that support both resident and tourism markets. Before we get into the directions of the master plan, I wanted to pause and just provide some context as to the role of Tourism Barry versus the city. Tourism Barry is considered the destination marketing organization and their key goal is to serve as the city's official tourism marketing agency. They're leading our marketing, they're providing frontline visitor services, conducting visitor profiles and supporting the development of tourism products and experiences that can be marketed. This is in line with the province's legislative mandate that 50% of the MAT go to a destination marketing organization. And the role of the city is really to be the driver of that tourism strategy if we are to build the economic impact of the sector. The role of the city is to provide that leadership on direction bring the tourist lens to our municipal policy and practice, as well as, our, as well as our infrastructure assets that support the tourism economy, as well as resident, residents, and to really invest accordingly. The overall strategy that the consultants identified are bundled into three categories. Building the destination, which focuses on infrastructure, policy, strategic directions, much of which falls under that city responsibility delivering the experience, which is the actual delivery of the service, and then telling the story, which is the marketing and positioning component of the strategy. From there, our consultants identified eight growth opportunities for our destination and an associated set of recommendations in support of those growth opportunities. I wanna make two points here before we move on to those highlights. 
One, the co consultants have clearly identified that the GTA Greater Golden Horseshoe Market is our key market segment that provides the greatest opportunity to build our activity and spend. And second, the waterfront here is identified as a key strategic asset. However, it's important that we look at the waterfront as more than just the waterfront. It's about managing the destination uh, and that drives tourists to a complete experience beyond just the waterfront. So whether that's coming downtown, shopping, dining, renting equipment to go through our park space, taking in a show, there's much more to draw tourists and tourists spend to the city. Uh, throughout the, the full master plan, of course, is in the appendix to the staff report, and there were 30 recommendations that came out. We wanted to highlight the top 10 and those that really fit into that phase one, phase two of the implementation. And the first step is really for the city to identify tourism as a priority sector. This ties directly into Council's current strategic priorities that speak to supporting the growth of the tourism sector. And adopting the master plan this evening will establish that direction. And in order to really execute on the recommendations and bring that tourism point of view to internal functions and other key sectors, including our arts and culture community, the city needs to have a dedicated resource to support the implementation program for the tourism master plan and be that conduit between city hall and tourism Barrie. Further, the consultants recommend ensuring that the MAT revenues remain focused on tourism and suggest the creation of a tourism development fund to support tourism initiatives. The city also has a strong support tourism base to build on and has recommended that the city and tourism Barry to continue to develop a sport tourism strategy that looks beyond hockey tournaments and starts to look at all season and shoulder season sporting activities, which also ties into the recommendation that we look at year round assets leveraging our outdoor spaces. It was also identified that there is opportunity to support visitor focused arts, cultural, live events, and really str str strategically position the area as a hub for the arts, including concerts and live theater. And this also leverages some of the uh, other area attractions in the broader region, including Burles Creek. Uh, tied to that event or that live event recommendation is the Fisher Project that in its current form seeks to deliver both a theater and conference style meeting space. I wanted to provide some clarification that the scope of the work for the tourism master plan does not contemplate whether or not the WA Fisher Project should proceed, but rather looked at the strategic opportunities and market demand and specifically what was important in a conference space. The consultants confirmed that there is a market demand and opportunity for business meeting and conference space driven by our proximity to the GTA, as that will likely be our largest target audience. Uh, and we are likely to attract more provincial conferences and meetings. The ideal space size would likely accommodate 300 to 400 delegates and would require some of the traditional spaces associated with a conference such as breakouts and crush space and larger um, trade space. A key criteria to the success of any conference center is going to be a hotel on property or in close proximity. And further consultants felt that the downtown provided the greatest opportunity to link spending with the tourism community. Taking all of this in, staff will be reporting back on the WA Fisher Auditorium project, independent of this report in the coming weeks. Top recommendations eight through 10 really focus on the need for strategic alignment and partner collaboration to ensure a consistent visitor experience with unique products that create a consistent story. And finally, as we look to prepare a prioritized implementation program into 2021, our consultants provided some guidance and some insights on what they thought some of the short-term short wins might be in recovery for this sector. Specifically, the GTA leisure market provides the largest influx of visitors into the Barrie area and will continue to dominate Barrie's visitor attraction efforts post COVID aimed at increasing present day volumes. Markets within a three hour radius provide a great opportunity for overnight visitation along with sports and really driving the outdoor activity opportunity for those visiting. We believe the tourism master plan will guide the city into strengthening the role and contribution to the local economy and we welcome your questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Schlichter. Appreciate the presentation and members of general committee questions. I know somebody indicated, but I'm sorry, my screen was still only on a few of you. Uh, Councillor Kungel, go ahead. Thank you, through your worship to Ms. Schlichter. Thank you for the presentation and a uh, very informative um, report that, uh, that adjoins it. I did have a couple of points if uh, you could help clarify for me. From a stakeholder engagement uh, and next steps, I was reading in the report that you had a tourism working group that was established with different representation between city staff and departments. And that this five-year plan um, really looks at leveraging sport, nature, and business. Uh, tourism. I was wondering if you had a particular individual that was uh, giving advice on the nature aspect that was external to staff uh, and and further if the tourism working group has now finished uh, its mandate or is that going to continue to be a, a group that meets through the remaining process? Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Kungal, uh, I can go through the list. I'd have to report back on, on all of the stakeholders that were consulted with in terms of the um, consultation on the outdoor space. Um, our consultants have finished their time with us, but they have certainly made themselves available to answer some, get into some more detailed questions. So I can follow up with you on that piece. Um, and the second question, and I should have written it down if I could get you to just give it to me again. <laughs> Uh, is that tourism working group, is that yes. um, group mandate complete or is that an ongoing working group? The way the mandate was set up, the mandate is generally complete. I would say that we are very, many of the organizations that were part of it, we continue to partner with Tourism Berry, BIA. Um, so it would be reasonable that we will continue to consult with them as part of that implementation piece, whether that continues in the same form or format, I think we'd want to revisit that with the tourism working group. Fantastic, thank you. And, and uh, um, an additional question. So when we talk a bit about, uh, and in the documentation, um, broader than the presentation, uh, you know, the references, the tourism industry is really our visitor economy. And so I know COVID is, you know, an atypical planning component. But when I think a bit about this past summer and changes we made for the safety of individuals, you know, we looked at our residents, I would say, as, um, you know, support local and how do we, you know, kindly uh, put a pause on attracting some visitors. And so wondering if we're going to see a negative impact of receiving people back. I don't think so. Um, but um, wanted to also ask about how are we, potentially looking at tourism differently around our residents actually supporting a lot of the tourism industry, uh, perhaps in the next year or more. And do we look at them a little bit differently through the learnings of COVID, especially through your business meetings around, uh, you know, the impact from arts and culture, and you've had great stakeholder um, feedback sessions. And um, I believe that's informing this, but wanted to know if, you know, we're shifting the focus on how reliant are we going to become on our residents to support that uh, kind of the tourism and local business and local economy for for a bit or are we still making assumptions about you know visitors really driving um the the, the tourism economy uh through you your worship to uh councillor kungal i think currently um it's a, a a bit of a mix to be quite honest if we take a look at what the tourism uh, sector has been reporting, especially over the past summer with some of the open space and even in dealing with COVID, we are a natural bit of a destination to access that open space. So there is still that element that exists. On the same note, um, I think having our residents in experiencing local where they might have gone to another community is also an opportunity. And I think we're promoting that as well. Come explore. Um, we did a promotional video session talking about some of the unique shopping destinations that are here with some of our unique owners or owners to try and draw some of that out. So I think it's a mix and I think it will continue to be a mix. Great. Um, uh, one other question. So as we are kind of going through this process, so I'm, I'm going through the process of engaging residents and thinking to do more engagement about reimagining our green spaces, right? And so when we think a bit about also what brings people to the city and what they want to stay and from a cultural perspective you know really looking at you know areas where we had 
um, families trying to congregate together and have those reunions and, and have those potlucks and shared space and knowing that our waterfront does become a bit congested. And so wondering if that's something uh, actively happening between parks and, and forestry and planning with Tourism Barry about how we might drive individuals to actually move out of the, the downtown and into green spaces and have some infrastructure there, be it barbecues or looking at how we permit differently to actually be a, about how do we help people kind of to stay and, and if you are gonna stay in Barrie, that it's a bit more of an affordable visit. So we do want you to, you know, come and eat in our downtown restaurants and support the downtown, but also around, you know, how are we meeting different needs of larger groups of families and individuals in time with these reunions and celebrations. So I didn't know if that's something coming back in the spring with your strategy is also around recommendations to council about where we want to see infrastructure, perhaps across the wards that support people who are visiting, family or are coming together to actually find space that they can enjoy and, and feel a bit of freedom of movement. Um, through you, uh, Mayor Lehman to Councillor Kungal, in terms of looking at uh, where we go forward with, with tourism and from a recovery piece and looking at all of our open space. Uh, that's certainly part of the conversation. How do you create those broader connections? Uh, and when we do our, our consultations in the next phase, we'll be reporting back in, in, in the new year. And I think we'll have more insights into that piece. I see Ms. Miller's popped up on the screen. So I don't know if she wants to add to that from the parks planning component. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mayor Lehman, uh, through you to Councillor Kungle. Uh, in addition to the work that economic and creative uh, development will be doing with respect to the tourism master plan, there is work that is happening, as you know, on the waterfront um, uh, topic that consultations will be happening at the end of the month. And then there will be ongoing work that we'll be reporting back to you in the spring with respect to some of those topics that you've talked about. Where can we encourage and how can we encourage um, um, shared use of, of our public space? Brilliant. Thank you all for there for other questions from others. Thanks, Councillor Kungle. Other questions of Ms. Lichter? Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you, Mary Lehman. I've got a, uh, three questions for uh, Ms. Lichter. Uh, I guess the first question I have is, uh, I did uh, attend um, our meeting with our experts slash consultants that uh, we hired to uh, help with the, uh, the master plan. And uh, a couple questions were kind of asked at that uh, meeting and I haven't seen any answers back. So I thought maybe I'd give you the opportunity to let me know that we have some answers, you're still thinking about it or if you need a little more time. Um, I guess the first question that I had was, you know, really Toronto versus Simcoe County. I mean, I expressed a, uh, a deep passion that uh, I believe that there's a missed opportunity on the city of Barrie really uh, exploiting Simcoe County and really putting Barrie on, on, on the map and really working with the rest of Simcoe County on drawing some integrated touristy type of things where you have a destination where you have a local resident from Simcoe County that's going to explore our own. And then uh, as a secondary, uh, someone from Toronto or out of town or out of country coming to Simcoe County, the experience would just not be Barry. the experience would be the rest of Simcoe County. And they seem to jump all over that, uh, got excited about that, and then I haven't heard anything else about that. So could you comment on that, please? Sure, Mayor Lehman, through you to Councillor McCann. In regards to the connection to the broader county and a regional, uh, or looking at tourism from a regional base, uh, that's certainly one of the key recommendations that came out, I believe priority recommendation number eight touches on the importance of working together to create that united experience. Um, and that certainly came back from the consultants that um, making sure we've got that connectivity, biking, outdoor space. So you're coming here, Barry has the majority of the accommodations. However, this is the landing pad and how do you get people to stay multiple nights experience inside Barry as well as the surrounding area. Um, Go train is I think another asset that helps achieve that. Yeah, I didn't get the answer really the full answer I was looking for, but maybe I'll continue offline and, and maybe we'll discuss that again next week. Um, thank you. Uh, the second question I have is, um, you know, the relationship between uh, Tourism Barry and uh, City of Barry. Uh, after this uh, master plan, uh, what can we see that's going to change uh, with that relationship? 
Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councilor McCann, thank you for that question. Uh, Tourism Barry has been involved in the um, consultation process. Um, they are currently our source for the MAT. I think you will continue to see the strengthening and definition. I think having a defined role for the expectations of Tourism Barry, a defined role for the city, um, and if we're able to implement some of those recommendations, you've got a stronger conduit between the two. And now we have a set of measures um, through our strategic direction um, and Tourism Barry is putting together a tourism, uh, their own strategic plan that ties complements ours. So I think you will see uh, an advancement of, of, of the relationship and working together towards a coordinated set of goals. So I think it's a strengthening opportunity and an opportunity to provide more accountability to both parties. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Uh, for those who uh, don't know, uh, Todd, uh, I'm gonna sabotage his last name, uh, Jenny Rowe, he's executive vice president of Burroughs Creek Event Center. Uh, he's expressed a great deal. He wants to get more involved uh, with the city of Barrie, with tours in Barrie, which uh, is, a, is a major plus when it comes to tours in Barrie. Uh, Jim Payetta, which is the co-owner of the Barrie Colts, is another great uh, uh, person to the board. Uh, we've also got uh, Louise Jackson, uh, who's uh, now the new president, and of course, Kathleen Trainer, and uh, there's a few more. And I really would like to see the strength from both parties uh, you know, uh, moving forward. So I'd like to get more involved in those discussions. So I'm glad to hear that, Stephanie. And last question I have for tonight about uh, the, um, the official plan for the, uh, the tourism is uh, Fisher Auditorium. And uh, uh, the next report that's gonna come out uh, in two weeks, you know, there was some great deal of uh, conversation uh, at our uh, meeting with our experts, with our consultants. And I just boldly asked, you know, is this the right decision? And uh, uh, you know, if, if they were in my position, would they be voting in favor of the Fisher Auditorium? And quite frankly, the answer was no, that this is not the right direction to go on. And then I asked about, well, has there been any consultation with the smart centers and maybe putting a event center who has a hotel already in the smart center, which is only, you know, uh, seconds away from uh, where the Fisher Auditorium would be. And uh, they kind of lit up and said, that'd be a great idea. So I'm not really looking for an answer tonight from you unless you have something. But what I would like to see in two weeks when you bring the Fisher Auditorium forward is that you dive a little deeper and give a little more answers to the smart centers and uh, maybe amalgamating and integrating a convention center uh, at the smart centers. And, and if, at least just letting us know what update us on the conversations that you've had with the smart centers. Thank you. Um, Mayor Lehman, through you to Councillor McCann, um, previous direction was that we ex we have a conversation with smart spenders to explore what the opportunity might be. Um, we will be doing that as part of our report back. Um, to get into any depth of conversation will require more direction from Council, but we certainly will have some preliminary conversation or preliminary feedback to offer. And I, I can... Uh... Thanks, Councillor McCann. I'll, I can just add to that answer. Um, because of Council's direction and interest, I had that conversation already uh, with Paula Bustard, who's the VP from Smart Centers in charge of development. Uh, we wanted the, the Barry project and we wanted to uh, set up a further conversation with the Invest Barry staff so they can talk about uh, the, uh, the potential on the site. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let Ms. Schlichter report back, but uh, my understanding is a full-size conference facility is not in the cards for smart centers, uh, both for parking and development interest reasons, uh, but they would be happy to partner uh, or speak with the city uh, with regards to uh, their plans for a hotel uh, and the potential for a facility in and around the downtown core. So, um, you know, I think she, uh, smart centers can provide a more formal response to general committee and uh, Ms. Schlichter obviously has a conversation, which I think is teed up for the next couple of days. Um, we'll see where that goes. Uh, but I, I think they're, they, 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 it's interesting. I heard the same answer from them that uh, we have heard before, uh, which is that's, that's really the business of, uh, of a hotel developer if they wish to pursue uh, a conference facility uh, as a, uh, a portion of a private hotel development. Um, and in some cities we've seen that happen and in other centers, Ottawa, Hamilton, a few others, we've seen the municipalities be involved, but it's, 
it is uh, a discussion that um, um, I understand is going to continue at least the form of potential partnership with smart sentences makes perfect sense that across the street with a, a hotel already planned for their development. Um, whatever might happen, uh, whether a Fisher project proceeds or not, uh, they would be closely integrated with our efforts to grow tourism in, in Barrie. Uh, did I see anyone else indicate with questions for Ms. Schlichter? Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Piggybacking a bit on uh, Councillor McCann's question about an integrated tourism uh, strategy uh, for with the county. Um, I think the, I think the word Councillor McCann I meant to use was leverage the county, not uh, um, earlier on that. Uh, Ms. Lister, would you think that the existing, I know council, we approved um, my amendment to the uh, parking pass. So kind of doing that pilot project for Simcoe County residents, Springwater, Oro, Innisfil, a lot of those neighbors who, you know, they spend 90% of their lives in Barrie, uh, go to our Barrie grocery stores, uh, go to our restaurants, but just happen to live uh, just outside. I, I'm not sure if we included uh, uh, Essa Township because they don't have a body of water. Do you think that a because uh, you talked about build train, do you think that a uh, the continuation of that pilot project um, in a more permanent role would help assist uh, attracting those uh, 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 golden horseshoe, but specifically Simcoe County uh, uh, potential tourists? Um, if one of the strategies, in addition to build train, was uh, the parking pass, I'm wondering if that would make it easier. Uh, you're unable to comment at the time because you haven't measured it or would have no net effect. Uh, through you, Your Worship, to uh, Councillor Morales, uh, certainly number two in the sense that we need to go back and measure, would we look at that as part of the implementation program? Um, that's something we could consider in the bucket. Perfect. So I guess this would just kind of be general words. I don't think there's, there's an item for discussion, but if Ms. James Reed is uh, listening, um, or even if she's not, you can bring this back to her. Maybe those uh, pilot passes can be coded somehow differently, have a different number, uh, when they're issued uh, in our database, they can be tracked. Um, and then we can kind of have an idea on when our bylaw officers, if that's even possible, when they're doing their rounds in future months, they can see, oh, look, the out of town pass is being used. And uh, while we may not be able to know how much they spent, unless we do some sort of survey, we at least know and uh, uh, can quantify number of use. Uh, and hopefully that, but again, I'm not a statistician, so I'll just kind of give some general direction. And again, the better data, uh, especially for some county tourists, the better. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Morales. Councilor Harvey. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I know our uh, hotels uh, here in Barrie through, uh, through the summer have done extremely well in comparison to uh, our comparators when you look across the province and even nationally. Um, and it's great that we have this plan moving forward, but uh, how do you see the implementation potentially being affected, uh, obviously, because we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic, or do you not see that as, uh, as being a potential uh, hurdle? Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Harvey, uh, this uh, part of the reason why we delayed putting together a timing for a recommendation program is specifically to your point is that um, we as a city um, and overall provincial health guidelines need to have us in a position where we are ready to welcome back visitors um, and how that evolves and in what format I think is still being uncovered. Uh, we are going through our second round of consultations. So we are hopeful by spring of 2021, we will have a better sense uh, of where things are at or you know, some, some key points that we can go forward. So the whole point uh, or the whole, our going forward implementation will really take a look at the program in context with what's happening from our pandemic recovery and make recommendations accordingly. I'm not sure if that addresses- Great. what thanks a lot. Yeah, no, I just wasn't sure if uh, certain things had already been recognized, but yeah, obviously we're, having to be very fluid with many aspects of our, even our day-to-day -day lives uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, others who have questions for Ms. Schlichter. Councilor Rettman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, uh, Ms. Schlichter for your um, presentation. Um, 
I, I think there's no doubt that uh, tourism is a really important piece of our uh, economy here in Barrie. Um, and I, I looked at the report with some interest um, in the in the area where uh, it suggested that we should be looking at sports and culture as, as sort of one of the drivers of of, um, of tourism growth. Um, and of course, the very first thing that I thought about was, well, you know, are we looking at then a 50 meter swimming pool, and a competitive pool? Are we looking at a conference center? Are we looking at a theater? Um, and all of those uh, had some big price tags attached to them. Um, so I'm just, my question is, do you have any sense of, of any low hanging fruit that we uh, can pick early on without having to spend a lot of money? Um, to get uh, this program started. I'm interested, like Councillor Harvey, in terms of uh, implementation, where do we go from here? Um, through you, your worship, to Councillor Rima, I um, agree with you. There were certainly some things that had a bigger price tag and some things uh, less so. So um, from a prioritization perspective, uh, and looking at the some of the low hanging fruit, one of the key recommendations that came back was looking at our existing outdoor spaces um, and, and in the form and function that they're in and how can we lever that space um, to be more tourist friendly or to draw individuals in. Same goes with downtown, same goes with our cultural assets. So even looking at our existing assets and their strengths and where can we leverage that all season piece. Um, those were some of the low hanging pieces. And then I think there was more development needed on the sport tourism front to really understand and prioritize what asset larger infrastructure pieces might be and some of those other programs. But from a low hanging perspective, aligning, positioning and leveraging the existing we have from that year round piece were some of the priority areas that we'll look at. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Ripmai. Any other questions? Back to you, Councillor Kungle. Thank you, Your Worship. Three to Ms. Schlichter. Um, I sent you an email with a couple of other pieces. Love to connect with you further on this. But one piece comes to mind um, as I've seen different grants and funding and attention um, to um, you know the broad topics of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And um, knowing that we are you know on the Highway 400 corridor from an immigration portal and County of Simcoe um, um, planning. Um, if, if we haven't yet, I'm assuming they've they've been involved, but would love to um, know how the Ethnic Mosaic Alliance has perhaps been a stakeholder or might be engaged before information comes back in 2021 around things that they see as opportunities for tourism uh, from a culture perspective. Um, they've been doing some great work, I think, around uh, also looking at different offerings that the city could provide. Um, and then the other piece, uh, so that's more of a, a, of a comment. I don't want to put you on the spot if you know if the Ethnic Mosaic Alliance has, has been engaged to date, and if not, could be seen as a stakeholder. Um, through you, uh, Your Worship, to Councillor Kungle, I think um, all of our stakeholders as we go forward need to be consulted, um, and the importance of looking at diversity inclusion, I think the, and, and our cultural, all of that goes together in the implementation program. Um, so um, if they have not been engaged to date, again, we're looking at the foundational principles in the strategy. Now we need to get to that operational component. And that is where um, all of those ideas or come into the funnel, come into fruition. So certainly that is on our radar. Um, we think that's important uh, overall, and we will be looking to, for an inclusive programming as part of our, our tourism master plan implementation. Great. And lastly, um, as I look at, you know, whether or not Barry is looked at an affordable place to visit and stay versus, you know, come for a couple of hours and move on or, you know, you know, pivot off the highway. Um, are we, do we have a sense of um, us being attractive from an affordability sense um, around being able to, um, you know, typically what it costs to to stay for a weekend in Barrie uh, and support local? And is that something that um, strategically we're doing programming that is also offering what's free or low cost um, around intersecting with green spaces, around cycling tours versus those things that we might drive 
you know, a, a premium or a cost or an admission fee. So I'll leave, I'll leave that to you more from uh, accessibility, not just in how we get to, get to uh, different attractions, but also how we complement having an offering for all um, that can offset, I think, any type of uh, um, considerations around what it would cost to come to Barry for a weekend or a bit longer. Okay. So leave it there. I'm yeah. assuming there's a mixed, yeah. Um, through your worship to Councillor Kungal, a, a lot of that, I would say, data analysis comes through the marketing programming through Tours and Barry. Um, so certainly, I think we can have that conversation. And through their um, marketing work, I know they market all across the gamut from um, park space, affordability, opportunities, right through to, you know, ski, stay, play. Um, so I think some of that is happening, but certainly that's something we can take back to Tours and Barry as a conversation point. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kungel. Uh, Councillor Jim Harris. I took a while, sorry. Um, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, Mayor Lehman, through you, Tim Schlichter, I just was curious. I know um, Councillor Kungel mentioned the uh, waterfront, and certainly this summer we had a, a interesting um, experience with the waterfront. But I'm wondering, you know, I think every effort we made to keep people away didn't actually work that well. So I think that people have found the beautiful waterfront of Barrie and are likely to return in 2021. Uh, so what I'm wondering is the ability to um, move the waterfront user from a waterfront uh, user to a, a city a customer um, and what type of strategy specifically and taking advantage of the fact that our waterfront and our beaches including the off um, uh, uh, neighborhood beaches like Tyndale and Manettes and Johnson and people who have found these can get into the city to start spending more money as opposed to utilizing the beautiful beaches. So. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Harris, uh, that was one of the key commentary that came out um, and one of the key concerns we raised with our, our consultants. Um, and in that implementation piece, looking at the marketing program and developing experience. So all of that comes in the implementation of the master plan um, in partnership with Tourism Barry is building out those experiences that you market that become more than just the waterfront, that there is more to experience and do. Um, so that is very much, again, one of those top priority items in the implementation. And we will certainly be speaking more to those in the spring when we report back. Great, thank you. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Uh, back to you, Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lewin. Maybe just some clarification from uh, Council Kungal. I uh, was a little lost on what you were asking, and I do sit on the board of uh, Tours and Barry, and I just got a text from uh, someone on the board, not really clear on on what you're asking. Uh, so just uh, not to uh, skip the broker of uh, Stephanie Slichter. Like when you mean affordable staying, like, like I, I, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Sure. So in general, I don't have an appreciation of if someone visiting Barrie would find it expensive to stay here versus traveling through Barrie and, and staying elsewhere. So how do we compare from uh, our overnight accommodation rates to what we really market and push from a tourism to say, you know, do people think if I'm coming to Barrie, I'm going to need to budget so much money to stay for the weekend and I might be making different decisions about what I interact with or what I choose to do. And so my bigger question is also, how do we show up? So we talk about in the report about, you know, so many kilometers or three hours drive, we want people to stay in Barrie. So within a three hour route, knowing that we're trying to attract the GTA, maybe there's a different appeal or um, assumption about what it would cost a family of four, um, you know, for a weekend away. Do we hit that mark? Is there any dissentives um, that we're not mindful of? or I might not be aware of to say, okay, how do we round out being more attractive? So do we bolster things like the nature aspect? So the things that you might do cycling or dog walking or hiking um, are very clearly marketed at maybe a no or low cost and become part of a complement of what you can do in Barrie um, at a certain price point. So how do we attract different individuals at different levels of budget for a weekend away? Are we hitting an elite level, right? So are we looking at visitors from a tourism to say, 
you know, typically you're going to spend a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars, or you know, do we offer and do we market um, to different income uh, and households, especially when we might find budgets are more constrained? So since we're just on the questions on the presentation at this point, I'll just ask Ms. Schlichter, I mean, I know there's some data in the report, I've forgotten where on our average uh, room rate by memory berries is a little below the Ontario average, well below certainly GTA rates, but is there information in the res, uh, report or informing the strategy on whether berry should target you know, a low cost uh, destination market, uh, higher cost and, and where we sit in the market today? Uh, Mayor Lehman, uh, there is data in the in the report that speaks to the kind of traveler. They do it more by um, demographic, um, families looking to experience. I think from an affordable affordability perspective, I think we are generally mid range, um, but the market segmentation, uh, I would suspect we'd have a little bit more from tours and bury on. But I'd want to validate that before I put them on the spot as well. But that would be where some of that informing comes from. Okay, thank you uh, for that insight. Okay, thanks, Councilor McCann. Back to you, Councilor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'll make it quick. Uh, Councilor Kungle, I totally knew where you were coming from. Basically, what's our value compared to our market? Uh, the, some, would somebody rather drive 15 minutes west and stay in Angus because the hotel's $80 cheaper? Yeah. Um, Ms. Schlitzer, based on your response to Councilor McCann's question, does our data capture uh, the market rate, not only of our hotels, but of uh, available units, aka Airbnbs, um, because it's a reality. And I, I'm thinking of the crowd that, A, people of all ages that stay in Airbnbs, but I'm also thinking of the concert crowd. They, uh, uh, they have a higher proportion rate of staying at Airbnbs than chain hotels. So if the answer is the data does not capture what a market Airbnb goes for, how quickly can we, I'm not even asking if we can because we need to, but how quickly can we get data on uh, what, yeah, how much it costs to stay at an Airbnb? Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Lehman to Councillor Morales, uh, we do uh, collect through our MAT um, uh, funds from Airbnb, that's volunteer, volunteer information. Um, most of that collection is done through finance. So I can, can, I'd have to go back and confirm what data we can extrapolate from that. But certainly I think we can get some data for you. Okay, perfect. The reason I bring that up is Airbnbs on the low end will be cheaper than hotels, but on the fancy end, they'll be higher. So it'll, it will affect that number that uh, Councillor McCann and Councillor Conger are talking about. Thanks, Councilor Morales. Any other questions for Ms. Schlichter? I just have two, uh, one comment, one uh, question about the presentation, then we can move to the staff reports. First of all, thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a very lengthy, extensive uh, piece of work, uh, which reflects the, the depth to which uh, I think you and your staff team went to in pursuing the subject and the, uh, and the uh, study team um, went to. Um, and I think, you know, you made it clear at the outset, this is a post pandemic plan. So I think one of the challenges for council and certainly anybody watching uh, tonight is, is it's hard to imagine having been in this for seven months uh, that we, you know, what the world was like even before this, uh, let alone what it will be like after this. But one can imagine that, um, you know, we will return to a world where tourism is is common, um, whatever changes become permanent or take longer to come back after COVID, though would certainly affect how quickly our local industry is able to respond. Uh, and that that's my, um, my question, I guess, um, is actually related to a piece that and I had the opportunity today to speak with several members of the board of Tourism Barry, and I want to thank uh, uh, Peter Haney and Denise and um, and Ken for their thoughts uh, and and the discussion. And I I echo the several councillors' comments around the uh, the partnership going forward uh, it needs to be a strong one. Um, and, and I think the uh, you know their their questions and and um, the discussion we had. Um, was focused a lot, uh, I think, on the the pace at which things will reemerge. But uh, one comment that I made to them, and I'm interested in your answer, is uh, there's a, sort of a few recommendations that speak to the food 
uh, opportunity in Barrie in the restaurant sector. For example, there's a recommendation around farm to table. Um, we have 400 and some odd restaurants in Barrie, uh, far more than the average uh, per capita. It's a larger industry in our city than in other cities. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the opportunity for us to uh, team up uh, with the hotel industry and ski and golf, I, you know, I personally think we're going to see an incredible ski season coming because it's one of those few solo outdoor activities that um, are entirely COVID friendly as long as the operators can manage the, the traffic in and out of their buildings. So, my question would be, I didn't see a lot uh, on the restaurant sector in the master plan. And I'm wondering if there is room as we implement some of these recommendations, particularly the short term ones, to try and build the partnerships with that sector, because we know this is one of the industries that's been hardest hit by COVID. Uh, thank you for your question, Mayor Lehman, and certainly I would agree with you that uh, the restaurant sector is a key part of the whole tourist experience when you talk about building that experience. So um, while it's not, I agree, it is not directly a shining light in the report, um, it is one of those underpinning assets that go into your um, developing the experience. And we would certainly work through implementation to, to look at that. Uh, we are also currently exploring some co-programming and opportunities to leverage uh, funding to also provide some additional opportunities to support those hard hit sectors in tourism uh, with safety protection and some other items. So uh, I'm hopeful that we will um, have some other things to report as part of that implementation piece. For sure. And I, you know, I think coming back strong for that sector in 2021, if we assume that things start to return to normal uh, sometime in the spring, summer of 2021, uh, we have such a, a, a great um, fundamental or base to work from in terms of the new Dunlop Street, the strength of uh, South End restaurants with the growth of Park Place. Many of them have invested in patios and outdoor dining. I think there's a, a real marketing play there that teams up some of the strengths that are in this report, the sports tourism, uh, the waterfront with, uh, with the restaurant experience. And, and I must admit here for our independent restaurateurs who maybe have a little less marketing budget or bandwidth than say somebody who's part of a, a franchise or a corporate store, uh, I think that could be particularly important. Um, the only other comment I wanted to make is I, I really did appreciate that we, in a way, went back to the sports tourism piece, which has been a few years since uh, Barry City Council took a real hard look at that. And uh, uh, of course, the, there was at one point a committee that was meeting and, and looking at that opportunity regularly. And I think it remains a, an opportunity. I, um, I wondered, actually, I'll ask you the question, the, the South Shore and um, one comment I, I've heard uh, from both residents and councillors is the central waterfront is becoming, you know, quite congested between boat traffic, people using the beach and the other uh, water, water sport opportunities that are already along the, the central waterfront. Did we look at, at the other portions of the waterfront for some of those opportunities? And, and obviously the potential, ex for example, to add a boathouse at the South Shore uh, which could be uh, a center for, I mean, it already is the canoe and kayak uh, club's home. Um, I know that there are some folks in the business community who think that there are other uh, non-motorized water sport um, uh, facilities that could go into that, that kind of a facility. Did you, was that considered as part of a master plan? Uh, Mayor Lehman, there were elements in terms of looking at the waterfront and waterfront experience in terms of what um, is are some of the gaps in terms of rentals and opportunities. So that was identified. Um, certainly looking at the sport tourism in a broader context, um, they do recommend we've done some asset assessment work but it's actually looking at the shoulder season piece and what opportunities exist there. Um, and there was a strong feeling from one of the consultants who is a sports specialist that we do have quite a strong base um, that for maybe some of the non traditional sports we have in the top of our head is our, our top ranking hockey being one of them, um, that there would be some other opportunities to leverage things that are outside of those peak seasons and drive more to our accommodation and where we have more capacity to support. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks for the presentation.
Uh, and again, thank you to staff and the consultants and also of course all the stakeholders, you know, it was uh, uh, tourism Barry played a big part, but there, uh, there was an entire industry here that um, are participated and gave you their thoughts. So uh, on behalf of council, I'm sure, uh, please pass along our thank you uh, to them and of course to your team. And uh, with that, we move right to that staff report, which uh, Deputy Mayor Ward, you held uh, so that we could have this presentation. So go ahead. I will put it on the put it on the floor and I do have a couple of comments about it. Go ahead. Yeah, I really appreciate that we have this uh, strategic plan for our tourism. I think it's the, you know, the thing that you, hopefully people will take out of it is how important tourism is to our local economy both in what it already is and what it could be and what it should be. Um, I think it's very important that we act on it. Um, I've got some minor quibbles. There were some minor mistakes in it. There were spelling mistakes in it. And uh, maybe I can call them errors of omission, which kind of bothered me when I read it. And I can talk about it later. Um, but overall, I found it very useful. And there was a lot of good data. I mean, even the fact that I think it mentioned there were 600 Airbnbs in Barrie, which was surprised me. I didn't realize there were that many in Barrie already. Um, and uh, so I'm looking forward to the action plan when it comes forward next spring. I do have one question. Um, I thought I'd ask it now since I held the item and I knew I was gonna get a chance to speak. And that's on the uh, strategic direction number eight, which is the USP, another term I never heard before, unique selling prop, pos prop position. I thought it was preposition, but it says position here. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's the same thing as branding. And I just wanted to find out how that comes about. How are we going to get that USP? Is that gonna be, we're gonna sit down and do it? Is it gonna be staff driven? Where are we gonna get that? It, I wasn't clear from reading the report where this USP was gonna come from in the future, how, it was, how we were gonna arrive at it. Is, is it the same as branding? I wasn't quite sure. First, maybe that's the question first. Um, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Deputy Mayor Ward. Um, their recommendation was really, first we need to start from an alignment perspective between Tourism Barry, BIA, the city, um, on that messaging component uh, that does comprise a piece of the, the brand perspective. Um, from there, I think we need to determine ourselves whether we need to go a step further and do any further branding or whether between um, the work that has already been done uh, that we're able to define our, our, our unique selling proposition, which is very much, what is our value? What is your reason for coming? And, and certainly ties to brand. So um, I would say from an uh, implementation perspective, and that's why you didn't get a clarity of direction, um, is that we need to first start with alignment on our message. Um, and then I think build on that piece from there. And I know that um, the BIA is working on an exercise as well around their brand. Do you anticipate we're going to actually come back with a, a slogan? I, I, I promise Councillor Morales it won't be well played. Are we going to come back with a, a slogan or something to brand us? Um, through you, uh, Mayor Lehman to Deputy Mayor Ward, I think we first need to start with a commonality of messaging. Um, and I think from there we can determine whether a slogan is really the best way to go or whether there is enough uh, diversity in our messaging that you stick with core messaging as opposed to a singular slogan. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Deputy Mayor Ward. Any comments on the staff report? The motion is on the floor. Okay, seems everybody asked their questions uh, during the presentation. So uh, I will call the question. Uh, those in favor of the motion on the floor, please indicate. I am as well, which makes it unanimous. Thank you, Ms. Schlichter. Thank you, uh, members of staff. And uh, uh, that will go forward to council next week for final approval. Uh, the other item that was held was the business plan status as at September 30th, 2020. It was held by Councillor McCann. Go ahead, Councillor McCann. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I got to tell you, when I uh, first read this report, uh, seeing a $6 million surplus, my first thoughts were, uh, you know, way to go staff and uh, way to go council. But then quickly, my, uh, my second questions were, you know, have we been overtaxing our residents? Uh, you know, have we maybe we've been making too deep of cuts uh, in our services? Um, you know, municipalities can only do two things to get out of debt. One is to increase revenues or to, you know, cut costs. And uh, I think staff, you know, with the limited time that I've read this report, unfortunately, uh, uh, Director of Finance, Craig Miller and I have not connected, which we will connect during this week. 
Uh, but uh, just how it stands, it looks like, you know, uh, we've recovered. But what I would like to uh, just maybe get a sense from Mr. Miller through you, Mayor Lehman, is my understanding is back in, uh, in March and April, you know, 10, 11 months ago, that we were uh, planning on having a $60 million uh, debt, you know, because of COVID-19. And uh, once again, you know, we weren't about to increase revenues in the time of COVID-19, but we were in the plan of cutting costs. And that's what staff and council have done is cut costs dramatically. And uh, I believe it was, uh, you know, five, six or seven weeks ago that uh, there was going to be a $2 million, um, you know, uh, loss. And, uh, and I just was kind of curious on, um, on uh, you know, the report says we're now $6 million going to be uh, in the surplus. And then I believe uh, through some, uh, some talks with Mr. Miller that uh, by the end of the year, we're going to be sitting up somewhere between one5 and uh, $2.5 million in the surplus. And I'm just a little curious on why the big variance and uh, our EMT, I thought that program that we spent millions of dollars on uh, really uh, narrowed down uh, what our financial strengths and weaknesses and risks would be. So maybe if Mr. Miller, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we could uh, maybe just get an explanation on my timelines, on my thoughts, and uh, maybe uh, clear up some of the, uh, some of the fog. Mr. Miller. Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor uh, McCann. Um, a lot of questions in, in that, so I'll kind of just piecemeal it a bit. Um, the, the reference early on, if uh, you'd reference the $65 million deficit, it wasn't a deficit. It was at the time when COVID hit way back in March, we didn't know who was going to pay their property taxes, who was going to pay their uh, um, wastewater bills. So at that time, looking at some Experts were sort of suggesting that there could you could see up to 25% of people or businesses not paying. So what that 65 million was was a forecasted receivable that we were saying by the end of the year, if 20% of the folks didn't pay, we would be we we could be at that level. Fortunately, um, that was before any stimulus money was announced, uh, any federal funding programs like the the CREB. So fortunately, that hasn't materialized. In fact, we've seen a pretty robust return on people paying their taxes on time. So from a cash flow standpoint, that's that's the lens that we were looking at. Uh, from a budgeting standpoint, so this this was as of September 30th, uh, where we're called at that time tax supported. Uh, um, rev, uh, uh, the budget at that time for tax supported services was showing a, a surplus of six million dollars. Now, if you read the report, a lot of that's driven by salary cost reductions. So a lot of people were laid off, um, services were reduced. Um, that's contributed significantly to the overall impact. As well, because of COVID, some work, minor work had to stop, um, which is now happening later in the year. So while it had 6.6 .6 million at the end of um, September, the number is coming down. So for example, um, uh, on the parking side, we know we're going to have about a million dollar parking deficit. We know the County of Simcoe is going to require anywhere from 600,000 to a million dollars more from the city this year to pay the, uh, our cost of the uh, long-term care, uh, additional costs that they're experiencing. So as we get towards the end of the year, I anticipate that as, as the report sort of suggests, we'll be closer to, uh, breaking even or in a deficit position. Uh, what you will see when we report on the year-end number is that the city um, will allocate out the phase two, sorry, the phase one funding we got from the province. So what that means is we're going to fund the costs related to the county from, where we're going to make a recommendation that we fund that from the phase one money from the province and the feds. We're going to replace the lost revenues we have had from parking. Uh, and other some other services like POA. So I would anticipate once we've allocated those funds to COVID related costs and revenues that by end of the year, we, we will have some form of a surplus. I think it'll be less than 6 million, but it will be uh, offset by some of the, uh, the provincial money that we got. And again, that number of 6.6 .6 million is tax supported. I, I do draw your attention into the report where we do talk about the, the parking uh, being in a million dollar uh, deficit above and beyond what we expense. So 
Again, this was a point in time as of Q3. I think as we, things are changing, but as we get towards the end of uh, year end, you'll, you'll see probably a closer line to what we have forecasted in uh, around the 2 million sort of deficit mark before we allocate the uh, uh, safe start funding. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Miller, for that uh, kind of detail and uh, memory work. And just with our EMT, are we not, uh, I mean, that is fully up and running, right? Through you, Marilyn, I think you mean the ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning System. So I got the wrong acronym? Sure. Yeah, so that's the uh, the SAP system that we have. Yeah, yes, we are using that up and it, it is up and running. Okay, and uh, and so so we should have a, a good idea on, you know, uh, per day-to-day -day where we stand financially. Um, I guess I'll, I've got a bunch of questions more that I'll ask offline uh, just because I mean, I want a lot more detail and I don't want to tie up council tonight and we can pick this conversation up next week at city council. But uh, the question I do have for you is, uh, you know, compared to other cities, uh, you know, forget the size of Barrie, just in Ontario, how are we standing? Like are a lot of cities uh, looking to be a, in the black in, in a surplus or are most cities uh, looking to be in the red in a deficit? So, Mr. Miller. Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman. Um, it really depends on what services they provide, Councillor McCann. So if you look at the large transit system, City of Toronto, uh, they're bleeding a lot. Um, Mississauga, those that have really seen a complete dry up of their, their, their transit services are hurting. Some of the smaller municipalities that don't provide transit services or long-term care homes of that nature seem to be doing relatively well. So it's not a relatively well being that they're not going into a, a big deficit number. So it's, it's not a complete apples to apples. When you, when you hear stories of, about cities, I think it's important to understand what services are they providing and, and what is their overall size. So there are some municipalities that are hurting a lot because of such large um, uh, transit services and long-term care homes and, and uh, uh, social services that they provide. We, pr we pay the county to provide those services. So the, the county is certainly uh, seeing an impact and they are, we'll be, we'll be getting a bill from them, um, as, I, as I mentioned previously, to offsets to pay for some of those co costs. Right. Yeah, I read that in the newspaper that they're not uh, asking their, their residents, they're, they're asking the city of Barrie. Um, okay, Mr. Miller, I appreciate that. And uh, we'll uh, hopefully connect, uh, or we will connect uh, later on this week, okay? Um, members of council, we have lost Mayor Lehman uh, briefly from the meeting. So if you can just hold tight for a minute, thank you. Well, it wouldn't be a Barry City Council meeting if I didn't have a technology problem of some kind. Um, welcome back, uh, my apologies. Councilor McCann, you were in the midst of talking uh, did you ask a further question of staff? Where do, where do we sit? Uh, we sit that uh, I'm finished asking questions. Mr. Miller and I are gonna talk later in the week and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks Councilor McCann. And apologies for that members of the general committee. Councilor Morales. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, Councilor McCann seems to be inspiring most of my questions tonight. Uh, Mr. Millar, uh, good points that Councilor McCann made about sur uh, annual surpluses. I know historically we don't, like I'm just gonna say the elephant in the room. Some years we undertax, some years we overtax. I know it's an elephant in the room to kind of issue everybody a rebate uh, because you just put it back in reserves and you know you smooth out the, you, you, you top of your reserves, you save for a rainy day and you smooth out uh, the, with the gains and losses and that's prudent fiscal policy. However, this year is unique. A lot of people are hurting, uh, a lot of people are not paying the property taxes and if they are, it's coming out of food, it's coming out of other things they should be doing uh, in their lives or to upkeep their property. Could you, when you bring the uh, business plan to us more formally in a couple of weeks, I, I, I always like seeing the PowerPoint that goes, this is where we're, we started, this is where we're going, this is what it shows. Could you have a line that after you do all the numbers that you do, essentially um, whatever the proposed tax increase is and then subtract or how many percentage points would be taken off that if we took that surplus that Councilor McCann was talking about and just directly uh, put it into offset any uh, tax increases 
uh, to uh, the 2021 tax bill. So in a way, refunding people without actually sending checks, it's just taking it off whatever 2021 increase. Could we see a line item? Because I think that would get us to where Councillor McCann's talking about. And I know that's, for, uh, you know, uh, people with uh, uh, prudent fiscal policy don't want to make that a trend. But again, this is a unique year. And I think it would be at least prudent to look at what uh, impact that would have. Could you do that? Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Morales. So again, I can't emphasize, uh, this was a forecast at, at September 30th. The year end is December 31st. Generally speaking, we do our year end close January. We don't have the final numbers in and around February of where we're at. So um, in a couple of weeks, when we bring the budget to you, I won't have any new information uh, as to where we are at that point in time versus what I've already told you tonight. Um, it, is, it is council's prerogative. They, they certainly could look at taking that opportunity and when they look at the overall budget and the needs that we have um, and, and to make that determination. So uh, the good news, the budget's being uh, um, considered at the end of uh, January, 2021. So there will be time for council to, uh, to weigh all the facts as, they, uh, as you go through the, uh, the Christmas uh, binder, which we'll be giving you. Okay, so thank you, I appreciate that. Let me refine uh, my questions to two questions. First one should be a pretty simple one. When, when those numbers come to us, could we have that placeholder number with the current projection? You're telling me we're not gonna get a new number, so let's take in that number Councillor McCann was talking about, slot it in. I wanna see what it looks like as a percentage. Is that possible? And then I do have a, I know that number's gonna change, so my second question will speak to that, but could we just do that with that number? Yes, no? Uh, Councilor Morales, using the September 30th number? Correct. You, you could, but I, I want to reemphasize, the city was given some money from the province to be allocated against our costs and lost revenues for 2020. So the number will change, um, but you can certainly take that, that, that number and, and do some quick math to see what that would look like. Okay, perfect. So then the second question is, and I, this is going to be a more discussion for later, but I just want to plant the seed so we can not waste time later whatever that number changes by, whether that surplus remains a surplus, grows or goes down, uh, I'm sure there will be some sort of uh, limitations to any monies we may get, aka can't be put away in reserves or refunded, I get that. So could we somehow pass a business plan that is, this is what the uh, property tax increase number will be, X percent, um, with the fluctuation of finishing year end and adjusting for all that. So if we think that the surplus is, you know, uh, I'm just gonna say a number 5 million and we do that and then that 5 million is offsetting the tax increase but it turns out it's actually 3.5. All of that is finalized once finance staff finishes year end 2020 um, and moves over to 2021. Can we, are we able to proceed? I think there's kind of a question to you and kind of a question to Ms. Cook. Can we pass a tax increase that is contingent on a projection and then adjust Actually, I just answered my own question. Of course we can. We already do it anyways because property tax um, bills are adjusted um, in the second, third quarter, depending on how much council increases it. So um, Ms. Cook, could you speak just to the procedure of us doing that? Um, so, and when Mr. Millar's department finishes their year end, how would that look like as a motion? Like it would just be wording adjusted by actual versus projected. I would refer to Mr. Millar to answer that question. Thank you. So Councillor Morales, we ultimately need council to approve the budget, to approve a budget number uh, that we need to, to fund all the city services. So if it's a, a, a number that's dependent on the year end number, we, we would have to come back to council and get them again to prove what that final number is, um, which would defer the length of time that we actually have a budget that the city could, could finalize and work with. Um, so to answer your question, you could do it, but we would have to come back to you once we have the year end number, which would delay, push us out further as to when we'd finalize the budget. Okay, that sounds unnecessary. Could we pass, there has to be a way we can pass. We, the way you, with all due respect, Miller, the way that was worded was it would delay it and maybe the, you know, the essential operations of government are essentially stalled uh, or the things that need to be spent are waiting on, on, on us to approve a number that we then directed you to go get. 
there has to be a way to keep the, the wheels turning and for that amount to be finalized. So um, like I even saw some faces, some, some counselors going like, wait, what? Like we would just have to wait and extend. There has to be a way to, uh, to do that. Do you know of any other mu municipalities that allow essentially government uh, the first two, three weeks of January to continue uh, doing what they need to do, the vitals, the sorry, the essentials, uh, while still waiting for uh, finance to uh, finalize year end. Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Lehman, to Councilor Morales. Um, again, it's it's council's prerogative. You could pass the budget that way. Certainly could. Um, we would we would continue to operate, but we would come back to you once we had the final number. Um, if if you were giving us a range to make sure we had the clear direction to. Uh, to pass the budget. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lair. Uh, thank you uh, for the time afforded, Mayor Lehman. Um, Mr. Councilor McCann, I think, I think you're onto something with your initial point. And for members of council, uh, even the ones that are new to this term, we've passed budgets in January, February, way before. So this December timeline is something new. I like it, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. And if, if it means we afforded our residents a substantial decrease in their, a substantial decrease in their potential future increase, um, it's definitely worth looking into. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Thanks, Councilor Morales. So just to um, reinforce, I think some of the key timelines and issues around uh, uh, both here and Councilor McCann's uh, comments, uh, budget approval at the end of January, uh, you know, I think in, in years past, uh, we have had a reasonable understanding of what a surplus or deficit would be by then. The question really is whether or not it's appropriate to allocate that to um, uh, tax reduction or not. Uh, our surplus policy has said, let's use that to fix more roads uh, when we have a surplus uh, through the infrastructure, contribution to the infrastructure um, uh, reserve. That's council's choice. And I think um, there will be a live discussion, I'm sure this year about uh, what we ask of our residents. And, um, but I think on the issue of uh, will we have information by then that is uh, able to allow us to use surplus or deficit from 2019 uh, against the issue in 2020 or, or from 2020 against 21? I think that's a that's legit and important. And in no small part, Councillor Kungal, Deputy Mayor Ward, and Councillor Reepman and I have been on Human Services Committee of the County. Um, the county is coming to the city for 7.7 percent more than last year. Uh, and that's a, that's a substantial amount of funding. And when I, I, I asked questions about that, um, the primary cause is an increase in long-term care costs, which I think all of us who've watched what's happened during COVID can understand why uh, the county wants to spend more on staffing and, and um, long-term care. Uh, that being said, it's a substantial bill for the city. Um, one of the uh, answers from county staff around how can the city pay for this was safe restart funding. So I guess the reason I raised that specific issue is first of all, to give general committee some visibility to the fact that we're gonna have um, the, at least the county, if not others, come to us for far more of a percentage increase than we are likely willing to pass on to our residents. And uh, as a consequence, uh, there's either going to need to be some give elsewhere, which has been traditionally how we've handled things, and, and I'm not sure we've served our own organization very well when we do that, uh, or we're going to need to apply things like the $6 million of safe restart funding towards the COVID-related costs that we're getting charged. And, uh, you know, where we're picking up a, a wage bill, which, you know, I absolutely support the need to pay PSWs, uh, more to have more staff in long-term care, uh, I, you know, wholeheartedly. But there is a bill for that. And if the province isn't going to pay it, then the county and the city and the city of Aurelia are going to pay it in, in uh, Simcoe County or going to be asked to pay it. So uh, all of which I raise uh, also by way of, as the two of you uh, have uh, noted, sort of a heads up as to uh, some of the budget pressures that are coming but also in this discussion around the safe restart funding and surplus or deficit from this year, maybe don't count your chickens uh, because I think there's gonna be a year end reckoning and a 2021 bill uh, for COVID that we don't fully know yet. And while I would agree that if, uh, if things turn out as well as this Q3 report seems to indicate, I mean, I'll tell you, I was blown away that tax arrears are actually lower uh, than in a non-COVID year. 
um, you know, all of the forecasting that that uh, I think municipal treasurers rightly did early in COVID uh, assumed that it, there would be a substantial increase in tax arrears. Tax arrears are down in our in the staff report itself. The the percentage arrears are are lower than our forecast. So. Uh, thank you to all those out there who have made the effort, and perhaps it reflects the other economic strength that we've been hearing about from the real estate industry and from uh, the labor market stats and so on. But all of which to indicate, I think by the end of the year, we will have a much stronger sense of how much COVID has cost the municipality, what it's going to cost the municipality. Uh, and then um, it will be on us to make those tough decisions around uh, how do we keep those costs off our residents? Uh, because certainly I would agree that um, at the household level, uh, we should not be expecting property tax to cover costs of COVID, um, notwithstanding the, the, the realities of, of trying to deliver services in, in that environment. Um, any other questions on this staff report? Uh, Councillor Harvey. Actually, my first question, Your Worship, will be actually on what you just spoke about, just to sure. get a little clear, more clarity, because I know I read the article that uh, hit the newspapers also uh, in regards to the county's request. And uh, the part that I found a little peculiar was it was the only the two separated cities that were going to see this increase and everybody else was going to be at a zero percent. Uh, just wondering if you have any color as to how that could be, because uh, it seemed especially ours is 7.7, .7, whereas Aurelia was like 16.9. And yeah. it just seems odd that the rest of the county's at zero. Yeah, I'll give you my quick answer. And Mr. Miller or, or Deputy Mayor Ward may be able to, to uh, augment it if I get anything wrong. As I understand it, there's two reasons, Councilor Harvey. One is the uh, funding formula. Of course, the city pays for social services and human services through a, a formula that's partly based on assessment, weighted assessment, and partly based on caseload, uh, whether it's Ontario Works caseload or the number of people in long-term care from Barrie and so forth. And uh, as I understand it, the way the math works out, um, it is not to our advantage. And then the second reason for it is because we only fund human services at the county, not corporate services, roads, forestry, garbage, all those other things, which Barry doesn't participate in. Um, the human services part of the county budget because of long-term care paramedics and an anticipated increase in social services, that's the part of the county budget that's way up. If we were participating in the global county budget uh, we wouldn't face such an increase. Uh, and I guess the reason that resonated was because Aurelia's extremely high number uh, is in part because they actually have a lot more residents of Aurelia in county long-term care homes than we have Barry residents. There's a, a relatively small number. Um, Mr. Miller, uh, would you be able to provide any more uh, uh, color on that answer? Uh, to, uh, to you, Mayor Lehman, I, I don't have a lot of additional information to share. I, I, I would suggest the number will be uh, less than, slightly less than, than what was uh, written about in the papers, just because of how we fund some of our uh, capital contributions to the county. But uh, it's, it's certainly, certainly an increase. And uh, when you get your binders in a few weeks, you'll be able to, to dig right in there. Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, just two additional points. One is the one you already mentioned, the county is taking some of their COVID money from the province and applying it to reduce the increase. And the other one is the county mentioned they're taking money from reserves to pay for things, which means their overall increase is zero. I mean, we can take money from reserves too, but it's not showing the figure that we get from the county, the bill we get from the county. Councillor Harvey. Yep. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just one last question for Mr. Millar. Um, I know we've received phase one funding, which I believe was like 6.8 million. Um, do you anticipate the phase two funding will, uh, will be applied uh, within the Q4 period? Uh, or is that something that we're probably looking at uh, well into 2021? Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Harvey. So the phase two funding is for the, the, the fiscal year 2020. The, the province has made that clear to us. Uh, they had indicated they, they will have a quick turnaround in December to know if uh, if uh, what which municipalities are, are receiving funds, if any, um, at this point. So it, we should know we should know soon. 
Great. Thank you. Sounds like it's good news then. Hope so. Uh, any other questions uh, or comments, members of council? Okay, seeing none, uh, Councillor McCann, uh, I think you put the motion on the floor as printed. It's just to receive the third quarter report. Uh, I will call the question. Those in favor of the motion, please indicate. Any opposed? None, that carries unanimously. Members of general committee, I believe that concludes, concludes our business items. It brings us to inquiries. Deputy Mayor Ward, do you have any inquiries of staff? I actually do have one. I didn't uh, give him a heads up, but just that question, that uh, somebody asked me this today and I wasn't sure the answer to it. Uh, on the weekend or yesterday's high winds, there was a sign on Bayfield Street that was not blown over, but blown to the point where they had to close the road because of it. And uh, who's responsible for inspecting? There was a lot of signs around the city and certainly a lot on Bayfield Street. Is it the city responsible for inspecting those signs or is it the province? I wasn't quite sure who does that, if anybody inspects them. I'm going to ask Dawn McAlpine uh, if she can answer that question. Because back, I'm going to guess. With the answer if they don't know it. Yeah. Uh, Ms. McAlpine, would you happen to know? Thank you, Mayor Lehman. And through you to Deputy Mayor Ward, I believe the sign in particular is the responsibility of the province. Other signs would be the responsibility of the property owner if they're on private property. Right. Um, yeah, we don't inspect. We inspect them, I guess, when they go up. But after they're up, we don't do have anything to do with the signs, correct? Unless there's a complaint with respect to the sign perhaps being moved or enlarged or altered in some way, we would not uh, be involved in inspecting them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Ward. Any other inquiries of staff? Okay, seeing none. Uh, announcements, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, I guess it's not going to be confirmed until next week, but I just wanted to uh, say I appreciate being uh, being nominated for deputy mayor for the next two years, Mayor Lehman, and uh, thank you for council for supporting it uh, unanimously on consent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed the role, and I look forward to doing it for the next two years. Well, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Ward. You did steal my thunder a little bit on that one, but um, we appreciate uh, your service and and your continued willingness to serve. Uh, are there other announcements of members of General Committee? Councillor Aylwin and then Councillor Jim Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I have a couple. Um, so the first, uh, it felt weird announcing this a week ago because it felt like summer outside, but night it feels less weird because we're certainly feeling a taste of winter today. So Noella is happening in downtown Barrie coming up in the holiday season. Uh, and just because the Santa Claus parade uh, is not happening this year and the tree lighting is not happening this year, uh, doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of fun things to do in our downtown and do them safely. Um, you can explore our new Dunlop streetscape, checking out all the activities downtown, like the Festival of Trees in Meridian Place and Heritage Park, the festive window displays in downtown businesses, and uh, the Noella tree and wreath blot in support of Hospice Simcoe. Um, so you can stay up to date on all things Noella by visiting noella.downtownberry.ca or by following social media of Downtown Barry at Downtown Barry. Um, also, uh, the Active Transportation and Sustainability Advisory Committee, uh, it's a really fun committee. We are a great group and we talk about a lot of really interesting topics. We have a vacancy, so uh, members of the public are welcome to apply for the vacancy um, and they can go to the city website or uh, to my website, keenan.ca to find the link to apply. Um, and you can submit it through email or by mail uh, on the website. So go to keenan.ca and find the link to apply to the Active Transportation and Sustainability Advisory Committee. And then finally, uh, I have an announcement uh, about the McLaren Arts Center's auction that's happening right now. Um, so for the last almost 30 years, uh, the community has participated in the McLaren Art Center's annual art auction. Um, it's going to look a little different this year uh, because it is online. So there's a two week exhibition of artwork in a range of styles by artists uh, from our region to view. Uh, you can view it in person uh, or safely online. So you have five days to bid virtually from anywhere, anytime. 
Um, and all of the items up for bid will be available to preview on the art auction portal. So they can go to mclarenart.com to learn more about that. So that's happening from uh, today, November 16th to the 27th. Thanks, Mary Lena. Thank you very much, Councillor Owen. Uh, Councillor Jim Harris. Uh, thank you, Mary Lehman. Uh, so just wanted to announce that there is a town hall meeting for Ward 8 uh, scheduled, a virtual town hall that is, uh, scheduled for Wednesday, November 25th, 7 p.m. Uh, Mary Lehman will be there, I will be there, and representatives from Barry Police will be there as well. So uh, please register at the City of Barry website. Also, the Facebook page has details as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Harris. Any other announcements, members of general committee? Okay, I have a few. Uh, I would like to proclaim November 18th as BS Center to a senior day and November 19th as Children's Grief Awareness Day and it's also Pancreatic Cancer Day uh, in the city of Barrie. And thank you to all the organizations who continue to do good work uh, around these important causes. Uh, well, we've already had some discussion tonight about the budget and we have already had tremendous take up from the residents of Barrie uh, on the use of the budget allocator tool on our website. Huge number of comments. Uh, when I checked in earlier today, uh, Ms. James Reed had indicated we've already had over 300 people use that and provide comments. Uh, thank you for to those. Um, please do check it out on the city's website. It will be open until uh, late December uh, to give us your feedback at buildingberry.ca. Uh, this is one of the, you know, often, often some of the best stuff that the city does uh, is just about connecting people uh, and then good things happen. Snow Angels Canada is a very good example of this. So for years, we've had the issue uh, in a, a city that gets more than its fair share of snow in the winter, uh, when we plow in the end of people's driveways, there are people out there who cannot manage. And we've struggled with how to address that as a city. Uh, Snow Angels is a volunteer program that connects volunteers with those who need a little help removing snow. It's an online platform uh, where people who do that, who need that assistance can post a request for service and volunteers in their area can reach out to help. This is one of the best things you can do to help your neighbors uh, and in this year when we're all uh, particularly focused on how we can help one, each, one another out, I really would encourage the residents of Barrie to participate in Snow Angels. It's a wonderful way to help your neighbor. Snowangelscanada.ca. Uh, on a related note, unfortunately, the on-street parking restrictions will take effect on December 1st. I mention it now because it's November 16th, which gives you, like me, two weeks to finish clearing out your garage of all the crap that we build up in there over the summer. So if you uh, uh, are, uh, are uh, thinking ahead, you've got about uh, two more weeks until we need to get our cars off the street. Uh, that is so that the city will be able to plow. Uh, we hope we won't have to do it before then, but if we do, we will declare a winter maintenance event and you will hear about it on social media and traditional media. And you may have to get your car off the street before the first, we'll hope not. We'll hope this warm uh, November continues and we don't get too much tonight. We haven't declared for tonight, by the way. I had a few people ask me today. Uh, we're hoping that the snow squalls that we do get won't be too much of an accumulation and it is supposed to be nice and warm later in the week. But there's your fair warning. Two more weeks and then uh, we do need everybody to get their cars off the street overnight. Uh, we are accepting nominations right now for the Mayor's Innovation Awards to celebrate businesses, individuals, and community groups who have tried to, who have pivoted during uh, COVID and uh, those who continue to deliver innovative models uh, to move their businesses and groups forward. Uh, the deadline for submission is December 17th. There is more information about this on InvestBerry's website, investberry.ca slash innovation awards. Uh, and I would also note the new official plan and citywide urban design guidelines are up for comment until December 22nd, and that one is at buildingberry.ca. Uh, last tonight, just a quick note on, uh, on COVID. Um, we did see a big number today, uh, although uh, a note as always, uh, the health unit reports three days worth of data on Mondays. So the very large caseload number you saw today is three days worth of data. But there is no question cases are trending up. 
Uh, and although our caseload numbers might not be trending up as quickly as some areas in the GTA, uh, it, they continue to trend up. Um, I, I wanna also note though today, um, you know, there was some very optimistic and important news about a second vaccine. And I think, you know, a lot of people are waiting for that news, but what it means, and, and I think the important thing it means is there is light at the end of the tunnel. There will be a vaccine, there will be an end to COVID, but it's still many months away. And the choice as to what happens between now and then still remains with all of us. So our job between now and whenever that vaccine becomes broadly available is to save as many lives as we can. And that is what we are doing by continuing to practice distancing and trying to fight the spread. And we're also supporting our frontline health workers uh, because this is all one province. And as we have seen uh, the spread move from just Toronto and Peel to now York and Halton, uh, we are nearby and it is going to be uh, doubly important over the coming months uh, that we try and keep the uh, spread of this virus as contained as we can and protect our more vulnerable residents, particularly our seniors. So we're in the yellow zone. Thank you to city staff and uh, uh, Rebecca James Reed and her team for putting out uh, the press release late last week to explain a little bit of what yellow means. Uh, it, it's similar to what was in place before, but just to reinforce, gatherings are limited to 10 indoors and 25 outdoors, but the health unit strongly advises people only have close contact with their direct household. And that remains one of the major areas of concern. Uh, workplace screenings must take place in the yellow zone. Face coverings are required in all indoor public spaces at workplaces and are recommended in places where physical distancing is not possible. Um, restrict non-essential travel, uh, monitor for symptoms, and of course, stay home if you're sick. Uh, there are some, a few additional restrictions on local bars and restaurants, although they do remain open, uh, but must follow strict protocols to ensure patron safety. Uh, and all of these details, of course, oh, sorry, I should also note our rec centers have to introduce some additional uh, precautions and restrictions. So there are some changes at our rec centers, if like me, you're, you're in regularly, you will notice some differences and you know, you're probably getting used to answering the questions, signing in at the front and uh, how uh, we can, can use different parts of those buildings. There will be some changes that you may notice if you haven't been in the last week or two. Uh, all the information on the um, restrictions is on the health unit's website and please continue to refer to that uh, single uh, and most important source of, of information about what is and isn't required locally and why, uh, simcoemuskokahealth.org. Okay, uh, circulation lists. Any comments on the circulation lists, uh, members of general committee, first November 9th. Any items from November 9th? Nope, uh, how about November 16th, tonight's? Councillor Ritma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there's an item, uh, on, on today's, and that is uh, C7, which is the letter from um, the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority. And we received a similar letter from uh, the Simcoe uh, Region Conservation Authority as well. Um, so I'd just like to um, move that to our next general committee meeting for uh, discussion and adoption, maybe if we can. Uh, that is, uh, we don't require a vote for that uh, to put it on the agenda. So, Madam Clerk, uh, Councillor Ritma's item can be added as an item for discussion, or at least that correspondence. Yes, Mayor Lehman. Thank you very much. Uh, any other comments in the circulation list? Okay, seeing none, that completes General Committee's meeting agenda. City Council is next week uh, on the 23rd. And of course, tomorrow night, we have Finance and Corporate Services Committee. So we will see some, if not all of you tomorrow night and City Council will return Monday night. Thanks everybody. Good night. Oh, Madam Clerk. Oh, good thing. We are supposed to go into planning right now. Sorry, uh, my apologies. Planning committee starts immediately following. I, I, was, I was doing my wrap up agenda. Uh, so um, we will, do you need a recess uh, before we begin the planning committee agenda? My apologies. Yeah, sorry. Read the wrong note, guys. That's embarrassing. Okay, uh, general committee, however, is adjourned. That doesn't change. Uh, however, we do have a planning committee, a uh, single item agenda under planning committee for tonight. So I will call the planning committee meeting to order. 
a welcome to the virtual planning committee meeting. Uh, the consent, I'll, I'll go through this. Uh, we do go through the consent agenda, even though there's only one item. So uh, tonight, uh, the one item on the agenda is an application for zoning bylaw amendment at 428 Little Avenue. Did anyone wish to hold that? Councillor Jim Harris, okay. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Harris. Okay. Thank you, Renee. I'm just trying to find my notes moving from one committee uh, to the next. And my screen is freezing, so it is freezing. Okay. Sorry, my anyway, my screen is frozen, so I'll uh, move that. We uh, can still hear you. We can still hear you fine, Jim. Yeah, I was just trying to find my notes on my iPad, but it's it's frozen. But I but I I, I think I have my notes uh in my in my memory is as good as I need to anyway. So thank you. I'll go with that. Um Mary Lee, I'm a question through you to um Miss Banfield. Um this um particular development, um, you know, certainly with reading what's been done between uh, today and uh, this report and the public and community meetings that obviously mitigated uh, the issues that were primary for residents. My question relates to some of the, re the related activity around uh, this development. And, 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 you know, we've spoke, so these are not surprises to you. You know, the condition of Foster as, as one of the roads that would be an entry point to uh, this development, even through the construction period or phase. As we as we sit today, Foster is rated as poor on the paper cushion index. It's already a really really bad road, old cottage road, narrow, really um, difficult to pass with two cars today. Let alone um, as a busier street. Um, I was surprised by the modest volumes projected in the in the uh, traffic study, but that's a, a a different item. But just wondered if you could speak to first and foremost um, the potential for doing something. Uh, for Foster, and I know we spoke as well about the urbanization, uh, which is uh, scheduled for this area, which unfortunately I've uh, heard today has been delayed by two years, putting it back to 2025 as a as a starting point, and then a, a beginning of construction in 2030. So it's way out there. So I wonder if you could speak to first and foremost, and maybe those are my two questions, and I've already said them, but one, uh, the potential for doing something with the road in the interim, and two, the possibility of linking the urbanization of the area, McLaren and and uh, Foster and Yates to the development at uh, Little. Well, thank you. Good questions, Ms. Banfield. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Jim Harris. So I'll just kind of rhyme off some answers to you. So as it relates to this development, it can proceed with uh, servicing off of Little and it will be on full municipal services. As it relates to the traffic for this development, uh, it has, um, there's two access points uh, for this proposal. Uh, so they'll be able to have the right in, right out off of Little, but then um, also uh, the, the other entrance. Uh, and at the same time, when it does co come time to develop, they will have to, the applicants will have to give us a construction management plan that tends to happen around site plan time to look at kind of some, all of those things that, that you talked about. As it relates to the overall infrastructure for the area and infrastructure improvements, um, at the time of writing the staff report and the current capital plan, the 2020 capital plan had those dates that are referenced in the staff report. And uh, you're right in a couple of months, or a month or so, uh, council is going to be presented with a 2021 capital plan that is proposing of a, a, a further a deferral of these projects for a couple of years, as you've referenced. Um, but that will be before council to uh, to make those decisions. Um, council or city building heard of a very similar issue a couple of weeks ago. And there is the option potentially for some um, pavement improvements, some interim pavement improvements. Um, at this point, that's not in the capital plan. Those aren't cheap improvements uh, regardless. Uh, that's not in the plan right now, but that is something again that council will be um, able to uh, review and consider along uh, with the broader budget discussions. So I hope those are all your points there.
Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Banfield. Maybe a follow-up. Uh, you know, I, I'm probably going to be the broken record on the urbanization and, and the number of areas in Ward 8 that um, remain uh, non-urbanized. Is in the scheduling of the um, urbanization projects, I know there's a history of delay, which is which this wouldn't be the first, unfortunately. And I know there's lots of factors, and this is not a, you know, an reflection of staff. It's a reality that we face. Um, what is the next scheduled urbanization project for um, Ward 8 for these areas? Is it the Foster uh, McLaren area where it's being delayed two years, or is there another one on the books that I'm that, that um, people could expect? So it's, it's not related. I apologize if it's a bit broader <laughs> than this development, but I, is this development, that is this area the next one to be urbanized, I guess? Through you, Mayor Lehman, to uh, Councillor Jim Harris, um, I've been, the research that I did, oh, I see Count, uh, Ms. Miller just jumped on to, um, I was advised that this is an area that absolutely is a priority. Um, but uh, so I'm not sure kind of what the actual order is, but but definitely know this is a priority and I'm not sure Ms. Miller may want to chime in. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Jim Harris, uh, the staff in the capital or corporate asset management team um, can certainly give you a report back on um, uh, the different uh, locations for those urbanization projects. Um, they're, uh, they're dealt with through that department. I mean, thank you, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Ms. Banfield. And I it just, when I look at the items that came up through this discussion, you know, really the potential opportunity, the hope for there being some leveraging to initiate the urbanization was certainly one of the key items that came out of this to residents. And actually, it's the one item that I've received the most comment on. To be honest, I haven't received comment on other items uh, related to the initial concerns uh, that came up. Um, since since the um, the public meeting, uh, but I have received and I have been on site to meet with residents on uh, McLaren about the urbanization opportunity and and so that's you know for the the, the reason for pursuing this particular element uh, and appreciate what's been done to, to mitigate the other issues as far as the setbacks on McLaren and and uh, those type of items uh, and the tree management those kind of things that were done effectively with the plan but. That really is the key item for residents. I want to make sure that that was noted and and hopefully we can do some things to move, you know, more and more citizens to full service and urbanize neighborhoods that uh, we all uh, expect and hope for in our community. So thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Harris. Um, uh, you had held the item. I'm assuming it's on the floor as printed. Yeah, pardon me, Mayor Lehman. Yes, on the, on the floor is good. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other comments, members of planning committee? Uh, I would just say, uh, I do appreciate that, uh, as the ward councillor said, a number of the concerns with this uh, particular development uh, were addressed. So, uh, but, um, you know, many of the neighborhood's concerns, uh, I can remember knocking doors on Foster Drive and people talking about when the road was built in the township of Innisville. <laughs> Uh, we're back that far, right? Um, so, uh, and I think it does uh, beg the question, you know, this is a rare case of, of redevelopment occurring in an area that hasn't even yet been fully urbanized, despite decades within the city of Barrie. It's one of those few remaining pockets. So it's a, it's a very good point, uh, Councillor Harris, around uh, can that urbanization be tied to development when the when this kind of a situation occurs and uh, and something that we should look at uh, when the budget comes forward, the capital plan in uh, in a few weeks time for sure. Uh, so the motions on the floor is printed. Uh, if no other comments or questions, I will call the question. Those in favor of the motion, please indicate. Are any opposed? None, that carries. Uh, and that completes planning committee's agenda. Uh, members of planning committee, thank you. This item will also go forward to city council. Madam Clerk, is it uh, for Monday as well? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, that completes planning committee's agenda. And this time I've got it right. Uh, we are done for the night and we will see you tomorrow night for finance and corporate next Monday for Barry city council. Thanks everybody. Thanks.